Today, we're going to explore the Open Images dataset and try to mimic a real time streaming dataset. We'll see how far we can get, fingers crossed, on being able to successfully wrangle this massive dataset right after this. everybody and welcome to Adventures with Yufeng where we explore new and interesting concepts, tools and ideas live from my webcam to your screen. My name is Yufeng Guo and today I'm excited to be looking at the Open Images dataset and to make an attempt at building a data streaming system. It's April 15th, Wednesday. I hope you're doing well and staying safe out there. Let's see what we got set up for today here move over to our coding environment. Oh, that is not the right one. Um, this one. <laughs> and I've already got our um, 
the same machine that we had up last time uh, open. I've made a few adjustments since then. Uh, specifically, I've gone ahead and downloaded those zip files, those pesky um, images and parts of the data set. So we were looking at the open images data set last time. Uh, and just as a review, it's a data set with uh, something on the order of, can I scroll down? Yes, I can. Um, for some reason, <laughs> this, okay, there we go. I was like not highlighting. 600 different classes of boxes spanning 1.7 million training images. And so downloading this was, as you might imagine, non-trivial. Uh, figure eight has the data set hosted online and it's hosted as eight separate um, parts just for the training data alone. So you see here train 00, train 01, 02, all the way down to train 08. And each of those are 58 or 59 gigs with the final one being just 42 gigabytes of images and these are images from all over the web and we have corresponding uh, validation data set of 12 gigs and a test data set of 36 gigs which we will basically ignore uh, for quite a while ah and i see rajan is uh with us again today thank you for joining um, yes, definitely hoping no disk issues. Um, on Monday when we did this, I got a, um, let's call it a crash course in dealing with disk partitions and mounting disk partitions in Linux. So, you know, thanks to our handy, uh, dandy work then, you know, we have our, um, four terabyte disk mounted and we've got, uh, let's see, what was the. I, I wrote down all the commands from last time, so this is why I like a good text file. df-h, and we can see that you know, we got our four terabyte disk, it's mounted, and we've only used 1.1, <laughs> only 1.1 terabytes. Can I make the screen font bigger? Absolutely. So we'll make the code font at least this size, um, maybe one more for good measure, let me know. And we'll up the web interface as well. So nice big text here. And if you have a preferred uh, color scheme, we might be able to tweak that too, but that might diverge us off course. So we've got our um, uh, data mounted. And what I'd like to do here is let's um, go over to the Jupyter Notebook. We'll see how Jupyter handles uh, these large data files. Uh, hopefully we don't run into any permission issues. Sometimes when we're in the Jupyter Lab environment, uh, because we're signed in as a user um, Jupyter rather than myself, right? When I'm in here, it's it's the actual username that um, GCP has assigned me. So these two are not technically the same. I can sudo on this command line, but uh, if I run sudo here, it, it doesn't quite work well. Yeah, sudo something. Let's you know, throw it on a load vim or something. It asks for this password, and you can dig into a long rabbit hole about it. But the short answer is pop and open the SSH uh, window is uh, fairly straightforward and kind of worth it. Um, and just if you're following along, if you wanted to do that, you're in your notebook instance, you can click this one. It doesn't look like a button, but you can click it and it'll take you to the compute engine, um, look into the virtual machine details page. And from there, you can actually just click this SSH button. And in, you know, I already have one open, but it's happy to oblige and open another one. And I might actually just leave that open in case we need it. But basically, well, actually, I'm going to close it because the other thing I did while uh, we were off the air was I installed um, Biobu, which is a kind of um, terminal multiplexer that's built around uh, Tmux, or you can use Screen if you want as a backend. And so I've got a couple of different windows running now. Uh, I'm going to actually make this wider so you can actually see the bottom of this a little better, assuming it'll catch up. Yeah, so you can see here I've, uh, I, don't, I don't have them named right now, but 0, 1, 2, and 3, and I can move between them. And that's how I was um, unzipping and downloading kind of in parallel, because again, these persistent disks are not actually a physical four terabyte hard drive, but they're just scattered blocks of data all across the data center that just are happen to be tied together. And so as a result, um, downloading in parallel all of these files was no slower than any one by itself. They were coming down 50 megabytes per second, um, just all four at the same time. So it was really nice. So with that out of the way, we can see, let me show you what, I, what I've got here. We've got each of the zip files, I've unzipped them, and you can see that um, 
the containing folders are just the same name. And I did do something to, um, oh, I forget which command I ran. I think it was maybe df.h, not df, du.h, gave me a count um, of, let's say, you know, train 05, or is it just the size? It was just the size, but this is the unzipped size. So that's notable because um, if we do a ls-l on train 05.zip, and we see that the, uh, not dash l, ls, dash lh, we see that the compress and uncompress sizes are about the same, which is a relief. I was worried that when we uncompress these, they were gonna balloon up a ton. And uh, let me know if the font size is big enough, by the way, <clears throat> at this point. And so, yeah, let's let's go into Jupyter and we're gonna CD into our mounted path here. I'm gonna copy this out, or I guess I should copy this out since I <laughs> asked for it. And we're gonna CD into that. Let me make this a little bit bigger too, try to close this up. Uh, actually, you know, I can click on this and make this go away for now since we're just using the command line. I'm gonna clear that and we can confirm that everything is working as expected. Uh, what would happen if I ran Biobu here on this command line? It, mm, yeah, it kind of works. Okay, um, for now we'll, we'll let that be. And it's still not reading my, I thought I tweaked the uh, bash RC, but it must not be sourcing correctly. Alas. Uh, do, 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 bash RC. Is it the bash profile? So, ah, because it's in a different home directory, so it's a different environment. So the Jupyter user, right, is different from this user. And so I can run l as a ls-l shorthand. I sometimes will use that. But that's okay, not a big deal. I'm happy to type out the full command. And let's cd into one of these, shall we? Um, And so we can see, oh, I did not mean to do that. You don't want to see the list of files, right? Because that's going to be super long. Um, so what we'll do instead is we'll try to, assuming Jupyter is able to deal with it, let's make a new notebook. We'll keep it Python 3. And we need to change the working directory because right now if we do an ls on the current directory, it actually does it in the working directory of um, whatever the Python notebook used to be in. So we're gonna cd to here. And now we should be able to see this. And we cannot. There's a reason for this, and I used to know it. There's a way to change the working directory of Jupyter and is not cd. So our friend, uh, Jupyter, change working directory. Thank you. And, and let's see, can we do it live? You set a variable, we can do all this thing. Change the directory you want, yes. So it's just a matter of using the Jupyter magic instead of using the terminal. Fair enough. So what we have here is, um, this is under train images. I'm actually gonna change this to <laughs> just be the mounted disk at the top level. What I've got is, uh, three folders and the structure is such that I don't know if this will change it might not um, hmm, That'll take a bit to browse in. I'll just leave that aside. We got our three folders each of them um, Here I'll go in here each of them have the same structure So if I do ls-l on validation images, we see that I have the validation.zip file the containing uh, unzipped vault version with the folder of images and the two corresponding CSV files. Um, I think what we're going to do today, just like we did um, when we were trying to download this, is did I spell validation wrong? That's validation images. Okay, validation images. Just like we did with trying to download, we'll work with the smallest file that we have, right? Which is the validation data set, just to take a peek at everything. So let's import pandas as pd, and then we can do pandas read csv. We're already in this path, so um, being able to, we should be able to pull these in no problem. All right, let's call this val data frame. I don't know what's at the top of this, and I guess we'll just run it. <laughs> ah, yes, of course, quotes. And I forgot to actually 
show some of it. Let's see how it looks. All right, so that read in pretty smoothly. Got lucky there. It could have not had a header or something horrendous like that, but it seems to have conformed to the norms um, just as a check because mistakes at this early stage can really hurt you. Um, let's do the same file oh, annotations. And we can confirm that yes, indeed, it you know the raw file compared to the um, how Jup uh, not Jupyter Pandas is seeing it matches up because we do want to make sure that we're not missing any columns, that we're not missing any rows. So the first row ends uh, in three F nine. It's funny a lot of these end in three nine six after that. It's odd. Oh, I see. It's the same image, right? Three F nine has just one box. The other ones have lots of boxes. So before I do this, I want to call out that the Open Images Dataset website has an Explore tab, which we didn't go into uh, last time, mostly because I wanted to get to the downloading part of things. So if we switch the type to uh, detection, object detection, and we can see this is what, um, you know, you can choose a category, right? We can say aircraft or um, ants. And so it's a pretty good browser already. So if you really just want to play around with seeing the data set, you can choose whether you want to look at the training or the validation data set. They have built all this out already. Um, part of me is waiting for someone to tell me like, oh, and they built this out and it's open source already. So you don't need to be building any of this stuff. Um, but it's a the, the point is not to replicate this exact infrastructure, but to make a kind of more generic system that is suitable for taking in data and kind of um, creating multiple data sets out of them. So as an example, let's say you have 100 pieces of data initially, and you want to train a machine learning model on it. So you might uh, just take that data, you know, split it up, train validation tests. Let's say after you do that, you have 100 images for training, right? And then you also have separate additional images in validation and test. And so you can then um, train your model but then your system, perhaps you've built this uh, information framework where there's more data coming in, right? And over the following weeks, months, years, you get more data. And so you need some way to incorporate the new data into your existing data set and train new models with, uh, off of that new data without having to do every single step manually. And so that's kind of what I hope to build with this whole uh, system. So that, that's a little bit more context here about that. So to start with, um, you know, any good system of, of this sort of thing, you have to have a way to really be able to look into your data and uh, ensure that it is what you think it is, right? So in terms of requirements, um, being able to visualize the data that's coming in and what data you're incorporating is uh, absolutely uh, required. And of course, it also needs to work, right? It needs to be performant, it needs to be secure, all that good stuff. Um, but to get us started, I want to write kind of what will probably be sort of a core piece of functionality, and that is something that can take, um, it, it's basically a bigger version of what we think of as an iterator, something that will just return the next chunk of data and abstract away all the mess of uh, reading the correct piece of the you know, which slice of the data, because remember there's eight 59 gigabyte zip files containing images in those folders. And so all of that complexity, we want to abstract away as much as possible so that when we then build the next layer on top of that, we have a kind of clean and simple API to work with. Okay, so that's kind of our goal today is, can we build that piece of functionality, that a uh, core set of Python functions, basically, that will reach into our mounted um, persistent disk and grab the relevant images um, that we care about. So the other uh, data frame that we want to look at, and at this point, I think we might just switch over to the training uh, data set because we're going to have to be able to work with that. And it'll be interesting to see if we run into, into any limits there. So here's our training uh, folder. As a reminder, we have our uh, train annotations bounding boxes 
which is the equivalent of what we just saw here. And the train image is boxable, which we'll see shortly. And that's the list of images, basically. It's the equivalent of the uh, validation images.csv, which just for completeness, I'll just show you here. We can see it's just two columns. It's the image file name and then the image URL. So I'm going to change this to train images. And we're going to change this to this file. Now, before we do that, uh, just as an exercise, I want to grab this. And we can do an ls-l on the validation images slash validation slash image.jpg. This should exist. Good. OK, so this spot check, sanity check type thing. You know, If I do this one, um, just do a couple here. Great. OK, so these images are here. They are unzipped. They're accessible uh, directly. And so ideally, we'll be able to use these CSVs and read them in and then uh, load them as um, basically then be able to randomly fetch images. And we would want to store the key value pairs of what we've seen basically as a kind of visited dictionary. But we want to store it in some kind of persistent storage. And we can see already. Um, Pandas is having a real good time <laughs> reading this CSV file. How big is this CSV file? One might wonder. I'm wondering actually. Train annotations B box we saw up here is uh, if only it was a human readable style. Come on, go up. There we go. So that is a 2.2 gigabyte CSV file. Okay, it's good to know and good to see that. Uh, pandas is okay with handling that. Um, I'm gonna not have this displayed twice because it's hard enough for it to be displayed once. And this should be train data frame. This is the one downside of changing all this is because it will be different when I read this in again for the validation data. Um, so I might just call this data frame for now. And we'll hopefully I won't come back to bite me. Let's call this. Um, Bounding box data frame, right? That's the, the generality that we're trying to make. And what did we call it before? Val data frame. So we're going to say that this, is a, this is such a hack, but it saves us the trouble of rerunning read CSV and still having these outputs look the same. I'm going to assign bounding box uh, bbox df to val df. And then that should allow us to run bbox df.head without any issues. It's all reference pointers and stuff, but it will serve the purpose we need for now um, without kind of, yeah. And I'll get rid of this and leave the one below it. And we're going to clear this output, which I don't remember the um, shortcut for, but there's a clear output somewhere. Clear output for that cell. Great. Um, and for future reference, uh, there is no <laughs> keyboard shortcut. so. That's good. Okay, so now let's got to think about this. Um, we also want to read in our other CSV file, our images. So I'm going to call that IMG data frame. Uh, we want to ls that again so we can see all these. So these are the train images boxable. I don't know why they're called boxable. I assume it's, well, I don't want to assume too much, but I suspect that it's because uh, there's also images that are not kind of were not used in the boxing, so to speak, because the if you look at this data set in the description, you know we have 1.7 images for uh, bounding boxes, but the full data set for just like labeling is um, closer to 9 million images. So there's it's a, we're still working with a subset, even though it's quite large. Uh, let's do this dot data frame, uh, not dot data frame dot head. Confirm it is what we think it is, and these URLs while relevant aren't um, super useful for us since we've already downloaded them, but it's a good kind of backup basically that we have. All right, so the next thing we're going to want to do is, OK, so we have a couple options to go from here. Um, let's see, in terms of thinking about how to design this system, the interface we want is something where we can say, like, data set dot um, next and say next thousand and have that return what do we want it to return as we would want the data to either be placed somewhere or um, 
kick off a stream somehow, but let's hold off on the streaming piece for now. Uh, we should, maybe we can have a, a whiteboard episode sometime. I'll point the camera at the whiteboard and we can sketch through designs. That might be fun. Um, because what I want is to have the data set, uh, data images gets copied to a, mm, let's say a bucket. We want the um, images that were kind of retrieved. Uh, image uh, file names are stored, uh, recorded as visited basically. Um, we'll probably do this in something, um, we don't need it to be transactional. So uh, SQL Server wouldn't be a required use case here. We could throw it into BigQuery, but like not too much to show there either. I'm inclined to put it into something a little more lightweight, something like data store or fire store, uh, which is a key value store, which is exactly what we um, are trying to do. So trying to pick the right tool for the right job here. And we want the um, you know future in the future, we could potentially future work, kick off pub sub job, not job, pub sub emulator, let's call it. Cause what I want to do is have all the images in a bucket and then simulate firing off kind of signals, right? Of saying, Hey, the, there's an image that has appeared. It's here. And then here's another image. Here's another image. Or we could also have it say, here's a hundred images. Here's another hundred images. And so we can simulate different types of uh, batching either one by one or hundred by hundred um, processes. And we can tie all of this to some kind of front end where we can control all of that uh, on the web from the browser. And I think that, that that would be really neat. So the first step is we need to be able to grab and keep track of, importantly, uh, the images that we've gotten. Oh, question. How did I start up a Jupyter Notebook and point to the that VM instance? Yes, that's a good question. So Rajan is asking about um, kind of the process of how this notebook came into existence such that these are linked, right? That I'm able to interact on the same uh, VM, both from the notebook and from uh, the terminal here. So if we back up a little bit in Cloud Console, right? If I click on my hamburger icon and I go to AI platform, which I've got pinned at the top, but if you don't, you want to scroll all the way to the bottom and then scroll up a little bit, a little bit, and then you get to the artificial intelligence section and there's a AI platform uh, section. And so you can either just click on that directly, but really what we want to do is mouse over and click notebooks. And so when you click on notebooks, it takes you here. And if you clicked on it directly, it would land you um, kind of at the homepage of all of these things. And then you can go on the, the left-hand panel and click notebooks. And so what I had done previously was I already opened up this, uh, I had created this I don't know, last week um, we, on one of the episodes. And you can basically do that by hitting new instance. And so what this will do is it creates a new virtual machine that is already pre-configured with the support with the libraries that you want, whether that's TensorFlow 1, TensorFlow 2, PyTorch, Rapids, CUDA, whatever. And you can actually customize fully that instance. In my example, um, I think it was eight or 16 gigs of RAM and, um, Maybe it's 30 gigs of RAM. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Rajan, Rajan's following. So what's interesting though, is I think maybe what you're getting at is this configuration, when I make a new instance, doesn't talk about uh, the persistent disk problem, right? Because that was the trouble that I was running into that the fact that this exists is, is the thing that I um, added this last um, on Monday. And so that was done um, by, if you click into this, we can go into Compute Engine. And so because the AI Platform Notebooks, all it is, is it's a Compute Engine instance with a specific image loaded onto it and some startup scripts that ensure that Jupyter um, will start up, right, when you start the machine. And it adds this button. So you'll notice that when I go to Jupyter Notebook here, take a look at that URL. It's not localhost something, something. I'm not port forwarding. I'm not tunneling through anything. It's literally just a normal HTTPS URL. And so they built a system basically to do, it's a reverse proxy that sits in between that VM and my computer, which allows me to just hit it and go to a URL. 
And so, of course, you can have the terminal here, which is the one way to do it, right? When I say new, I can make a new terminal image in the Jupyter, um, Jupyter Lab, but then I can go over to Compute Engine in the VM images. And if I give it a second here, um, I'll just, for example, use a different one that's turned to go down. And somewhere there's stuff about disks right here. So right here we have, I'm going to make this bigger, um, a section about the device name, which is just the one that's already there. And here you can add additional disks. And so you can click Add New Disk. Or you can, in fact, attach existing disks. But adding a new disk we'll cover first, right? You can give it a name, give it a description, standard, etc. You basically only have to specify the size. You know, and the bigger you make it, the high, more performance you'll get out of that. Because again, those blocks are sharded across the data center. It's, it's all that stuff. So the bigger it is, the faster it is, um, which is can be somewhat non-intuitive. And that's that's how you would add a new disk. Now I'm going to hit cancel here and go back up. You can also attach an existing disk. And so the specific way I happened to stumble through this was um, I tried creating this by creating a new virtual machine. I just was creating a new virtual machine and then added another disk to it. And then I realized, no, I actually want to attach it to this existing uh, VM that I had with Jupyter all configured and set up, and that'd be great. So I just clicked attach an existing disk, and then you can just um, choose one from the dropdown. Now, this is the trouble I ran into. By default, persistent disks are zone specific. And so this virtual machine was created in US West 1B which was not where I happen to have an existing persistent disk. So you can see here, this VM that I'm in is actually US East 1 because I'm in the East Coast and I wanted you know, to save myself the back and forth across the country when I'm SSHing. Um, and so the price I pay, we can see here if I go down to disks, is that I have our, our disk somewhere here. This, this is the boot disk and the one I've created, Open Images Disk 1, because I thought maybe I would need a second disk, embarrassingly. Um, and it's our 4,000 gig, and it's also in US East 1C. And we can see that it's attached to this VM right now um, in USPy, right? What's worth pointing out, though, is if I created a second virtual machine also in US East 1C, I can attach this persistent disk to that VM as well and at the same time. So I could put, could potentially mount this disk to two VMs and have both VMs downloading files to it, say these giant zip files, right? And you could have this disk then be a, I was hoping it could be basically a golden copy of this data set from which I can just read from you know any number of instances that I want to be able to interact with this data set. I also considered putting it on cloud storage um, directly. But I was worried that it would be too unwieldy having so many, you know, literally millions of individual images. And so for now, I'm choosing not to. And I might actually <laughs> put them onto cloud storage. When I say copy to a bucket, what I'm really referring to here is a Google Cloud Storage bucket. And so I'll basically have that be the action that pushes it up. So hopefully that makes some sense on kind of how this infrastructure was set up in, in terms of this development environment. Um, and yeah, happy to go into more of that and answer questions there too. So uh, I think the first thing we need to do then is set up, unfortunately, <laughs> set up some way to, we want to look at the GCS um, SDK, the API, right? And then the uh, Firestore SDK, okay? So for starters, it's the GCS SDK is pretty straightforward. I've worked with it before. We should be able to get that up, no problem. GCS, um, cloud, API, something like that. Um, here's our thing, here's that. Let's just open a few of these. Oh, client library, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, a lot of this is already pre-installed. So if we go over to Python, um, I'm pretty sure Google Cloud Storage is installed already. So I should be able to import this directly. Oh, it's not quite that though. I don't think that's not going to work. Um, it's <laughs> it is here, um, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so Google Cloud Storage is there, but that's not how you um, that's not how you which we'll call it call it in in Python. And I see there's a typo in the Anaconda uh, configuration. No <laughs> distribution insert board 
should be TensorBoard. I'm going to screenshot that because A, it's kind of funny, and B, it's a typo and should be fixed. So get that saved off. Um, what is TensorBoard? That would be a funny library. Someone should create it and then <laughs> it'll get rolled into Google Cloud's um, cloud storage libraries. That would be funny uh, as a dependency. We won't call it, obviously. Okay, so this is our API reference. Eh, it's not exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for, um, okay, API, yada, yada. This is one of the tricky things about all this is just like figuring out which of the various kind of styles you're looking for. Okay, we're back to where we were, which is either good or bad, right? Either means I found it. <laughs> Uh, doesn't support 2.7 alternatively use okay this is all about app engine not what I'm looking for let's go to the Python reference ah yes this is what I'm looking for uh, note that support for Python 2 is gone perfectly happy with that um, storage client buckets okay so we have a bucket I did create one at some point open images v6 it is empty and we're gonna drop images into here I think I'm gonna make Mm, I'm going to make the same folder structures. So I'm going to make a uh, train train images or train. Well, this is the thing, right? We have this structure here, train images, validation images, test images. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it the way because there will be CSVs, potentially, and metadata files. But there are all images. Um, I'll just leave it train for now. See if this comes back to bite me or not. Train validation and you can always change these worst comes to worst uh, create folder test and then we're gonna need to have oh make a note of this URL so let's see GCS bucket uh, GS colon slash slash our bucket name slash train since we're working with the training data right now this is already in here let's make a note of that um, And going back to the storage client, we need to make the client. Uh, there's usually a decent sample I can just grab. <laughs> ah, yes. Shameless um, grabbing of the sample code. Because the only thing better than writing your own code is you borrowing the code. Borrowing. It's, it's just borrowing. I'll return it. Promise. Um, See, we make our client, let's see, we set bucket, what is this? This is for create a bucket, you know, we, this is, we're not trying to create a bucket using a resource, but it's a start. We have our client, now we want to be able to, I really wish there was like a, this doesn't get wider, okay. I was really hoping there would be something to help with getting the um, objects uploaded. Blob class. Not to do. Okay, here we go. Grab a bucket. So we say what bucket we are. Then we can um, create the blob. Then we have to upload to the blob. This is just for checksums, but we'll use this code for now. Uh, there should be something about download to file. See, I really wish there was a list of all the methods that didn't include all the definitions, because then I wouldn't have to. Um, scroll through this really long document manually. Pretty sure there was an upload. Upload from file. Yes, this is what we want. And if you want, you can set your own encryption key. Don't particularly care to do that, but there it is. All right, back to here. We already have a client. We're going to get a bucket name that we have here. Uh, it looks like the bucket name is without the GS. So this is one of the tricky things is bucket names, sometimes um, systems want a bucket name, they want GS colon slash slash, then the bucket name. Uh, other times they don't, and there's uh, sometimes no way of knowing. So that's cool. Let's see, we don't want an encryption key. We don't need to define an encryption key. We've got our bucket here. Mm. We got our client. We might have other clients, so I'm gonna call this GCS client because we're gonna have the Firestore client later. Um, and this code will eventually get refactored. But for now, it's a notebook, it's a mess. Uh, I see there's a blob secure data bucket. Hmm. 
I suspect that this is the file name. Well, and then this is the local file name. And yep, that adds up. All right, how do we create this blob class? That should be at the top of this upload from file name. Upload the blob's content from the content of a named file. Now, there's no example, but I feel like we should be able to get away with this because this is specifically upload the content from a file-like object. We don't need it to be quite as complete. I suspect that upload from file name should do the trick. Upload the contents from a supplied string. Yeah, upload from file name should work. File name, content type, client. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, let me see if the storage client has an upload thing built into it. So upload, generate a post and upload a file. I don't want to generate a signed post policy though. That's seems unnecessary. All right. I guess we'll have to do it the, the way they've designed it here. Um, blob. Yes. Blob dot blob dot blob blah, 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 blah. Um, bucket property. Do I even need the first one that we made? Goodness. Uh, what do we, what do I have? Paste? Oh, upload from file name. All right, I'll store that here for now. Uh, where's the initialization? Storage dot blob dot blob. Is that really what it's going to be? Bucket dot blob. Get blob. So that's the correct import. At least it's not blob dot blob. <laughs> And let's go over here and do that. Uh, that's also an import. Let's keep it up here then. Um, oh, I probably could have just done storage.blob. Let me try that before I run this. Uh, storage.blob um, import storage client. Yeah, okay, so it's still storage.blob. And we're going to call this the same file name as one. So let's let's pick a file name, right? Pick a file, any file. Uh, this is the CSV. So the path we're looking at is, I'm going to add a couple of variables at the top here. This is the train folder, uh, containing folder. <laughs> Got to keep it generic for when we need to do this for validation. Um, otherwise, yeah run into trouble with this before. Uh, train images, yeah, good. Train images, and then we want um, the file. Let's hard code this for now. I haven't looked at this file. It will be interesting to see what it looks like. I am not the most skilled um, vision, like visualizer of things when I try to visualize things. So I'm gonna pass on that for now, but we probably could use PIL and show this image before we try to just upload it blindly. Mm, file name, uh, let's call this local, like it'll be the same one, but the point is that it's the local file name, which we will mirror as the um, one in the cloud, read, upload, my file, my file, yeah, let's give it a go, all right, all right, GSCS, oh, I didn't, that's what I get for not. What do we got? Local file name is not defined either. Come on. Run this. <laughs> this is what I get for running things out of order. Let's just run it from top to bottom. Run this. Import. Create a client. Upload. All right. No such directory. That is correct. Um, let's also import OS. And... We want um, os.path, didn't even use this containing folder, uh, nonsense. I can never remember if this is the right syntax. Path, prefix, directory name, exists, expand. I feel like they used to be like a join or something like that. I can just do a string join if I have to, but the return value is a concatenation of path and any member of paths, exactly one directory separator following each non-empty part except for the last. 
meaning that the result will only end in a separator if the last part is empty. So let's test it out just to confirm because I can never seem to remember these things when it's time, it's time to use them. All right, yeah, that, no, take it, I'll take it, that's good. Got it right on the first try. All right, got it wrong on the first try. Still no such file or directory. I got the wrong folder name, didn't I? It's train images slash, in our case, train zero zero. Ooh, an interesting situation. Which zip file is a given file name even in? I assume the first one is in the first um, folder, but in general, this is an interesting problem we have to get around. Uh, we need some way to map images to their uh, folder shard, call it. Making up names and making up words, it's all good. Mm, what do we call this? It was train zero zero was what we suspect the containing folder to be. We'll see if I am right or wrong. This is another reason why using the... Um... All right, it didn't not work. Uh... <laughs> see upload mm, download the file where is the one that we just did get send URL blobs 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 come on upload from file this is the one we just did it returns parameters raises it doesn't return. No, it's got to return something. Uh, right. Huh. Well, maybe it doesn't. Okay, so let's look at the folder. Did anything get uploaded to this bucket in train? Oh, <laughs> did I upload it to train or not? I might not have. I'm going to hit this refresh bucket button, and we're going to see if it's just sitting in the root directory. It might be. Yeah, it is. All right, well, it's not the worst thing. Um, it's a start, right? Okay, let's open this image. Let's see what we're working with. And that just opens it, downloads it. Didn't expect that to happen. All right, what is it gonna be? Any Anybody got, put in your guesses for what this image is. <laughs> Could be anything. And it's a statue of a baseball pitcher in front of AT&T Park in San Francisco. One miracle. Very good. Could have been worse. Um, let's get our uh, images organized. So we don't care what folder it goes into, right? So with this, um, we want to upload it to just, uh, which one would it be in then? Storage blob open. So this is the local one. And this is the cloud version. So local file name. And we want it to be, um, what was it? Train? Train? Yes, train. Train slash plus local file name. Who said I couldn't concatenate strings? Um, let's see if that works. Uh, I should have captured the return value of that. Upload from file. Still very curious what that would come back with, but hopefully the file will be there. Yes. Okay. Good. So cloud storage works. It's good. Um, this is far from a robust system, right? It is both very brittle and very hard coded. We can refactor this into something a lot better and turn it into a clean Python script. Notebooks are for experimenting, not for production. So. We'll want to kind of abstract this out into a nice function. Uh, we could have it be a function that, well, we can use kind of what we have here, right? But at a low level, we should break it up further. Let's just have a function that upload image. And let's say we only need to provide the image name. Mm, can we get away with that? Maybe maybe the data set um, type like, um, split type so that'll be train validation or um, test so at least we know which top level folder to grab it from but the hope is that we'll build a separate system for determining the mapping of a given jpeg file name to what shard it sits on 
and that might be kind of just a batch job where I read through and just search for it and it would be ugly. Um, and I suppose I could put them all in one folder, but yeah. So, all right, let's just keep it at that for now. See if we can get away with only doing that. Um, we're gonna need those libraries. We'll fix the imports later. We had this. We had, uh, we created a client. Just paste everything back down and then we'll clean it up after. All right, so this is a starting point. Image name is um, local file name. Uh, we'll hard code containing folder and we'll uh, default split to train um, because I don't have a system for determining the containing folder yet. This is to do uh, build system to find the right folder. Uh, and then uh, this bucket is hard coded. We'll make something for the magic screen there. Ooh, this split could be here. Nice. Um, split plus uh, that. So I think if I just do a quick test here, if I say um, foo and bar, uh, yes, well, make those strings. Foo slash bar. Yeah, that's pretty much what we want. Um, yeah, sure, we'll do that again. OS. Come on. All right. OS.path.join split and local file name. That should do train slash local file name. We'll make the client. Uh, all the validation code will happen before that. We'll add that at some point. And we don't need this anymore. And I still want to know what this is. So let's return that. Um, yeah, that should do it. And let's call upload image and pass in a different image name. Let's go to the next one. Um, next up, we have this image. And it's got a tab at the end. So we're going to get rid of that. And it's going to print the output of this, so the return should show up, whatever it sends back. It sends back nothing, and so there's no return. That's good to know. Um, that means we should handle errors directly inside. So to do, handle any exceptions. I thought I saw something about what it raises, so we'll get back to that. Uh, what do we have in here now? Let's refresh the bucket and see if we have two files. The hope is that there's a second file, and that second file should be called and in F3E, that's this one. And what do we have behind door number two? Two folks on a beach. All right, two ladies on the beach. And okay, so that kind of works, more or less. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, before we continue, I wanted to mention that on Friday, we will be taking a slight detour from this project, a slight, call it a pause, but we'll be back next week. Um, I'll be live with my colleague who is in Austin named uh, Dustin Ingram. He is one of the maintainers of PyPy, the kind of repository that we all get our um, libraries from, and uh, we'll be building a system with Cloud Run and basically a scalable web app that calls a machine learning backend. And so this will kind of figure into the broader um, infrastructure that I'm trying to lay out, right? On the front end, on the front side of things with this data and splitting it up and passing it in, um, we are building this out. But at some point, I'm gonna to need to be writing some backend web code and front end web to kind of tie it all together. And so this will be the beginnings of the makings of that. We'll be uh, probably using Cloud Run, Python, a little bit of HTML and JavaScript, and um, calling some kind of machine learning backend system just as a placeholder, basically. For now, I'll probably grab an off-the-shelf object detection model and um, throw that up on AI platform training or AI platform prediction, and just pull down predictions from there. Uh, the main point of Friday and our and my time together with Dustin will be to build out this system using Cloud Run, which is kind of Google's, I don't know if it's a new take on App Engine, but it's basically a container version of something like App Engine that just scales for you and it's like fairly stripped down in terms of having to deal with a lot of the underlying infrastructure. And um, the big note is we will be live coding for two hours. So you get uh, 
double the the bang for your buck on Friday. It will be live from same time, still 3 p.m. Eastern, but we'll be going until 5 p.m. So be sure not to miss out on that. Okay, so while um, we were talking about that, I sort of forgot what we were doing. Pretty typical. Okay, so this is a decent function. We This is a good test. And then I want to do a quick, oh, I need to include the, all the includes above too. So that'll be a little bit of cleanup later. Um, Firestore. Do we have time for Firestore? And we see somebody's excited for the two hour version. <laughs> and you get double, to two of us for two hours. So it'll be double for across the board. Firestore, um, client library, Python, yes. Thank you. Google knows that I write code in Python, so I'll take it. Great, here's Firestore. Uh, Firestore is Google Cloud Firestore. I don't know that this is installed by default. Um, it'll be easy to test, we'll just <laughs> import. Okay, import. Oh, it's there, great. Um, and we can create new documents, do all these things. Okay, so now we're starting to tie into the cloud side of things. For this project, don't remember what I've got in Firestore. Firestore is our document, not document, our key value database. Let's take a look at our data in Firestore. I really don't remember if I have anything of this. Um, oh yes, this is the thing that I built with Brett. That's hilarious. Okay, so if I start a new collection and we call it um, images, right? Uh, open images. And the first document should be a string. Um, still not really sure what a document ID means. I'm going to have to give it a field name, um, placeholder, let's just call it. And a field value. Um, okay. What happens if I do that? So in messages, we had a document called this and it had a field name and a field value and we had another one that had a field name and a field value of US Central for some reason. Central doesn't exist. Yes, that, that did happen. That was a pretty funny problem. So in this one, we added a document and it's placeholder text and then foo. So that's okay. Okay, so we can add fields to the same collection or we can Start a collection. Yeah, the, the concepts on these have always tripped me up. Like all I want to do is have a bunch of key value mappings, right? And um, a document, okay, how about a document? And then we'll just say, uh, we want to map from a image name. So something like, you know, abcd.jpg and we'll have the value as true as in it's been found, right? Um, or it's been used because I don't want to pull the same image twice. And so uh, copy similar document. No, I don't want to do that. Do I? Add field. Okay, so field is in the same document. Start collection. Give the collection an ID. No, no, that's the top level thing. Why are there two start collections? Um, I guess you could have a collection inside of all of that. That would be crazy. Okay, so we want to add a document with, what is it called? A field name and a field value. Okay, one document, one field, one value. We can do this. Um, make, let's just copy this out first. Um, make a client. Then we are going to make a collection. Um, what did we call this? I already forgot. Open images. And make a document. Uh, we'll call it train scene, right? Visited. Oh, uh, visited. It's a visited pattern. We should use visited. Docref dot set. Um, this can be um, the file name. Uh, I'll just call it ABC hell, and then we said we were going to call it um, true. It's a string, and that'll be it for our little object. And we want to query for, why do we want to query for documents, right? And 
for doc in the user ref string print to this thing. What was the point of all of this? Oh, this sets one. Hmm. Is it just one document per thing? Oh, there's two. There's two. Okay. And if I run it again, but I say one here, I have another one. Oh, it replaced it. Oh. So the key is actually um, the document. This, this is the key. So if I make another one, we say train visited one here, that makes a new one. So uh, I should actually say visited is true. Yeah. And so the file name, this is going to be the file name. So in our example, uh, we had something like this. And so we have a file name and visited is true. So here now, uh, it's already updated, which is great. Uh, this is our file name and visited is true. And so when we go in and we want to look to see, you know, is something exists, right? If we go and try to find a document that doesn't exist, let's, let's rename this to like, nope. Um, and then we can query for documents in this collection. What's going to happen? It'll just show the list. Oh, I guess I don't need this line. I can just query, right, get the list, list, and then um, in this user ref.stream for all these things, right, I can check to see if um, a file is there. Eh. Not sure if that's the best design ever. I feel like there's, there's there, I know there's better query modes. I can directly query instead of doing a giant list so we can have a much fast, much more performant um, lookup, right? That's the whole point. And, um, but I think considering I made that from just the base example, it's a good base example, first of all. And um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll call it there. Uh, again, as a reminder on, um, let's see, let me get to this view, okay. As a reminder, on Friday, we'll be doing the two-hour live stream with myself and Dustin Ingram on Cloud Run, web, scalable web applications, calling a machine learning backend, of course, all in Python. And we'll be, um, yeah, that'll wrap out the week. And then next week, we'll be back again, same time, same place, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at 3. And I've got an exciting guest lined up for the following Friday as well. So be sure to stay tuned. And uh, until then... I'll catch you on Friday.